Okay, guys, let's uh, get back to business. So I want to spend a little bit of time going, although we have passed that section, I just want to spend a little bit of time, and this is the point that I discussed in the other section, uh, which I have not discussed with you, which is now let's imagine that you are, uh, let's say trying since we wanted to make Rajan guilty. Let's say Rajan is, uh, has been accused under 497. Okay, and uh, you are defending Rajan. Now, what would you try? So the question is now put yourself in the shoes of a defense lawyer. And given the structure of section 497, what would be your obvious uh, strategy? What would you aim to prove in order to defend Rajan? Yeah. So we, do we have a mic? Yes, yes. Uh, just give it to him. Let's try and use the mic because I want to get people used to this idea of uh, using, you know, the practice of using the mic. Because many people I notice when they speak on the mic, the mic is here and they're talking like this. So the you have to be while you're speaking on the mic, you got to get used to public speaking. One is the confidence because many people I notice that they try to avoid speaking through the mic. Okay, uh, so you got to get comfortable with that, and also you have to be aware that you have to be listening to what your uh, to your voice coming through the mic. So if it's not coming through, you should make uh, amends. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Uh, sir, uh, to prove Rajan that uh, he is not guilty, we can say that Tom somehow. To prove that Rajan is not guilty. Yeah. Yes, we can somehow prove that Tom had a certain idea about the affair of Jane with Rajan because uh, it would somehow prove that it was his consent and he knew and he cannot blame because Rajan is guilty according to the law if Tom did not knew about their relation. Did not know. Yeah. Did not know about, yeah. their, about their affair. Yeah. So we have to be careful about the use of the words because you are saying aware and know. Consent is not necessarily implied by awareness or knowledge. So in legal, uh, in legal uh, settings, you have to be very specific. If you are going to prove that he had the consent of Tom, then you have to go for proving that he had the consent of Tom, merely saying that Tom was aware. Mere awareness need not necessarily be construed as consent. So you have to be careful. But I understand what you're saying. You are picking on this particular clause. One is without the consent. Okay. But supposing there was no consent. So that's good. So that's one of the things you would try to prove that there was consent or connivance on the part of Tom. Okay. Now, suppose there was no consent or con connivance. What else could you try to prove to get Rajan out? Yes. Uh, Sakshi, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, it is mentioned that uh, they were having an affair, but sexual intercourse is happening. It is not mentioned. No, no, that's okay. Here, I've assumed. I un understand. But I've, in this, when I've said affair, I've said that assume that affair implies sexual intercourse. So yes, but it's correct. So that that also is a good way of thinking. But in this case, I have closed that uh, loophole. Yes. Now, what else could you try to prove? Yes, Rajan himself, he wants to come to his own defense. Okay. This is called. You should learn this term also. This is called. Pro se litigation. Pro se litigation means when we say in the court, when we say he's a pro se litigant, that means this litigant is representing himself. He's not represented by an advocate. Pro se means for himself. Yes. Rajan, yeah. Sir, I can defend, defend myself by saying that Jane hit the fact that actually that she was married. Okay, good. So that's what I wanted to get at. So essentially your line of attack would be to show because there is another clause in this section which says that and whom remember this is and whom okay it is not sufficient that he has had sexual intercourse with a married person with a married woman okay and there is an and here it's not or it is and okay so and means the second part also has to be satisfied so therefore he must have known or he must have had reason to believe that she was the wife of another man so if you can show because there are some married women who do not wear the sindoor and things like that. So there could be other ways in which the woman may have actually concealed or basically created a, situ created a situation where uh, Rajan had, uh, uh, you know, he, he did not know that she was the wife of another man or did not have any reason to believe. Like one example would be not having a sindoor, etc. or not through any other behavior. So he was, you know, he did not have any reason to believe that she was the wife of another man. Right. So if you can establish that, then again, the ingredient of the section, the, the charge will not be made out because one of the clauses of the section is not satisfied, which is actually joined together with the other clause where the word and if it was or it would be different. So you have to be careful about how all these words make a difference. Okay, in the interpretation of sections, also, is everyone. Also, there is no point of taking consent from Tom because he himself is having an affair. 
with another one called Chitra. No, no, that's a different, that's a different situation. <laughs> That's a different situation, okay? So, but even then, one sec, but what, what uh, Chopra is saying, that again will not be valid because uh, remember if Chom has an affair with Chitra who is single, okay? Or even if Chitra is not single, okay? The fact that if Chitra is single, then Tom would not be guilty anyway. Because under the 497 law, then Tom is not guilty anyway. Or if you take the other hypothetical, these are all called hypotheticals, okay? You should be aware of all these terms. These are techniques that are used in law schools. What we are doing here is again examples of hypotheticals. So we take a law which is written in a particular way and then we say, okay, so maybe there was a robbery, okay, in the bank, there were like two people in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the robbery, okay. But what if there were seven people? If we say that, what, is there, what if there were seven people? When we discuss scenarios like this, these are referred to as hypotheticals, okay, in, in law school discussion. So we say we have this hypothetical. So we have the hypothetical that she is single. In that case, she's not guilty. Okay. But if you have a more uh, uh, relevant uh, hypothetical where even if she is not single, in this case, Tom is guilty. Okay. But the fact that Tom is guilty under 497 would not in any way exonerate Rajan. So what the line of attack that you're adopting, this will have this kind of problem. So Tom may be separately guilty if Chitra is uh, also, uh, you know, married. Okay. But in this case, again, Chitra's husband would have to bring the case or the police would have to become aware and bring the case. Okay, so either the state or the, uh, you know, uh, person who's actually agreed. Okay, you know that there is this concept of, this brings out also the concept of something called standing or locus standi. This is another term that we need to know. There is like, for instance, essentially what happens is, let's say if Chopra's house has been burgled by somebody okay if it's if it's a criminal offense it's different okay let's say for instance if there's some kind of co contract between Ch rajan and chopra where rajan is not paying the money that he has agreed to pay to chopra because of some transaction maybe he sold his house and then rajan has not paid the money to chopra okay now in this case i cannot go and sue rajan because i am not aggrieved in any way i am not i have not uh, been injured in any way in a legal sense so i don't have what we say in the US, uh, in, in the US parlance, we would say, I don't have standing in this case. So only Chopra has standing, okay, or his legal heirs who might be also affected, they can have, uh, they can sue. So only the person who is actually affected can sue in the case of civil uh, problems, okay. But if it's a criminal offense, if I know that somebody has beaten up somebody or somebody has destroyed somebody's, uh, you know, uh, property and caused a lot of damage where there is a violation of a criminal uh, provision because criminal law is essentially there is an interest public at large has an interest so if i go and report to the police okay if i can i can also file a complaint that this person was beaten up and then he was grievously hurt etc i can also file a complaint to the police and the police have to accept my complaint in the case of a criminal case but all, here you have to so of course this is a criminal uh, this is part of the criminal statute so in this case this would apply that any person would go and would be able to go and uh, uh, you know complain but in, a gen in general, and if this is actually more like a, uh, strictly speaking, this is more like a private offense. So on this concept of, you have to be aware of this concept of standing or locus standi. In India, we say locus standi. We say that in this case, I would have no locus standi to sue Rajan because of his non-payment of money on the sale of a house to Chopra. In this case, I have no locus standi to sue Rajan because I am not affected in any way. So you have to look at who has actually been injured and who has been in civil cases, in civil matters, okay? Who has been injured or who has been uh, aggrieved or who is aggrieved and only that person has the right to sue, okay? Or the uh, standing to sue, okay? The, so, so coming back to this point that basically uh, this is a point that I wanted to highlight that you can pick on certain clauses in the section and you can try to argue. So the same kind of logic applies even in a civil case. Even in a civil case, if you are accused of some, if you are, if somebody is raising a claim against you on some ground, okay, related to some particular section taken from that section. So you should look at that section and look at all the parts of the section and see if you can nullify one of the parts, which is essential to the, in, you know, to, to making out the offense or the shortcoming under that section. So you should try and see if you can nullify one of the parts and then the other person's uh, allegation will not be sustained in the court. Is this clear? You understood the strategy? Yeah. So what is the civil case? Can yeah, sorry, give him the mic. Let's use the mic if we can. It takes a little bit of time to pass the mic around, but I think we can deal with that. So yeah. Can you please give an example of a civil case because I don't know what exactly is a civil case. Civil case is something like this where like say Chopra sell, sold a property to Rajan and he agreed that he would pay 25 lakhs for that property. So there is an agreement. There is an agreement to sell. When you sell a particular property, okay, there is an agreement to sell. 
okay so there is an agreement to sell they agree that he will sell this house and he will get 25 lakhs in return and on the actual appointed day so he has actually registered done gone through the registration and transferred the property to rajan's name but rajan has not paid the money so that's an example of a civil case okay so anything basically which is not uh because there is a category called tort also which we'll come to later but there is generally crimes are you can see obvious things like uh, you know robbery theft decoity beating people up you know uh you know previous hurt hurt etc so uh and then you can see some unusual offenses which are in the penal code like adultery etc which has now been struck down okay so those uh now there are certain types of offenses like negligently if you drive negligently or recklessly driving and you cause somebody's death that would also be a criminal case okay so there are uh so those are cut, but generally all these other matters are civil cases okay so contract. contract breach of contract and all these are all civil cases basically right all these property related cases where somebody is suing somebody okay saying that two brothers are fighting over a property okay or somebody is fighting the tenant you have to remove the tenant that's also a civil case okay yeah yeah so the jmb is responsible or if i find guilty or she is fails to disclose the fact that uh, she is married which one are you talking about 2.1 or 2.2 so you said that uh, uh, if she Uh, the fact that she is married and uh, Tom uh, Rajan will not be held guilty. Yeah. Also, uh, then uh, Jane will be held guilty. Okay. So, who wants to answer this question? You want to give her the mic? I think uh, Jane will not be held guilty. Yeah. Because uh, it's written in, in such cases, the wife shall not be punishable as a deliverer. Okay, so the wife has a blanket, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, exemption. Okay. So this is again, you have to understand. On the face of it, it seems to be good, but this actually is coming from a patronizing approach towards women, which is that women are so inert that they are not capable of doing anything on their own. Okay. So that is the kind of mindset from which this comes. That the women must be always uh, exempted because. So this actually not on the face of it, it sounds like a good thing. Yes. Give him the mic. We like now like a four like by hundred meter relay. No, we should learn how to pass the mic quickly. Yes. Yeah. Can't we have a medical report because of or a postponed session intercourse? We can have a medical report in charge. No. In what? For what? Medical report for what? To prove that uh, Rajan is not guilty because a session intercourse is always uh, done with the mutual understanding. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can. So that's another line that you can take. Here we have not assumed that. We are here. We have assumed that the fact of we are assuming that uh, the fact of sexual intercourse is not being disputed. But if you want to dispute that, that is also a line that you can take. you can also dispute that okay so uh, but here we had proceeded on the assumption implicit assumption that the fact of sexual intercourse has not been disputed we are just trying to see whether there is any other escape route okay so that's what you're right you can also look at that aspect okay so you can look at that as well okay so we just wanted to spend a little bit of time on that so uh, just just to rehash that as part of the recorded portion now where did we go yeah yeah i need to You need to go to the medical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go, please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what we had done is we have already covered the uh, the Nirbhaya case, right? In this class, we have already covered that, and we have covered legal formalism. Okay. And what we have not covered is legal real. So everyone is clear about formalism yeah. from the Nirbhaya example. I think you can understand clearly what is formalism. That. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Give her the mic. Black letter law essentially is okay. The so black letter law essentially is nothing but okay. So it's 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 fine now. Now you can. Uh, so I understood. So her question is, what is black letter law? So it's good. So I'm sure many other people also didn't understand, but at least she has asked the question. So anything you don't understand, you should ask the question. Even comma, full stop, semicolon, even that you should ask. Okay. So uh, black letter law essentially is just a way of referring to the law as it has been written down, because obviously everything that we read. almost everything we read is on a white background and black uh, print okay so that's why we say black letter law because the law as as it appears in black letters okay so this is an expression that is used in the law we refer to the word uh, we use the word uh, expression black letter law to refer to the law as it is written down so normally it is used in the context of legal formalism where we try to say that we should follow the black letter law okay 
all right so here um, you can see here that the formalism means should apply them to the facts of a case without regard to social interests uh, their idea about public policy okay so again uh, briefly which i think i didn't mention in the other class which is that uh, formalism and realism and we'll, we'll see what realism is but both of these terms can be used either in a descriptive or a prescriptive way okay in the sense that what they're trying to say here is simply that uh, we can discuss formalism in the way that I discussed the Nirvaya judgment with you and showed you this as an example of legal formalism. Okay, so in, when I was doing that, do you think I was using the term legal formalism in a descriptive way or a prescriptive way? In a descriptive way, because I was trying to show you what is an example of legal formalism, where I was saying that in this particular judgment they have applied the judicial philosophy of legal formalism okay but i could also use it in a prescriptive way okay which i will when we discuss uh, when we finish the discussion where i could make a case for why now we could start talking about whether formalism or realism is a better approach okay because there is a debate actually a very active debate especially in the us is a very active debate in india also we have this thing going on the tussle going on but we don't really have an active public debate about it okay but in the us there's an active public debate about legal realism versus formalism and in that debate if i come out and say that okay these are the reasons abc why legal formalism is a superior approach uh, to legal realism okay in that in that case am i using the word formalism in a descriptive or a prescriptive way now i'm using it in a more prescriptive way because i'm saying that this is a better approach so is this a normative can you see that is normative because i'm saying this approach is better okay because of abc reasons this is a better approach so better or worse this is kind of difficult to establish in a debate okay because it's it's based on value judgments and value systems etc right so therefore when i'm using so therefore that's all the state said sent, uh, this sentence what it means is this is all that it means okay that you can use these terms either in a descriptive uh, setting or in a uh, prescriptive kind of setting where we are arguing about the merits of the two systems whether formalism is better or realism is better okay all right so these are just some formal definitions of uh, of, of uh, legal formalism okay uh, formalism another word that i think i did not use textualism okay textualism is a word that we use more in the U in the us than in india but we can easily use it in india as well it's this it's kind of very similar to formalism formalism has a slightly broader scope textualism essentially means that you should follow the text okay that's what it means textualism means following the text okay so that means you should follow the black letter law you should just follow the text of the law and rule accordingly you should not bring your personal uh, uh, personal views about what is socially desirable or what should be the right public policy what would be the right public policy judges should not bring their personal preferences on uh, social uh, mores or customs or public policy their personal preferences should not come into the uh, judgment in the way they pronounce judgment the judgment should be based on exactly what the black letter law says okay so textualism is being bound by the text okay so uh, another term i think we can easily insert here is that um, a you should know these terms okay then we don't use it so much in the indian context but in the u.s context but we can still uh, we should be aware of this which is um, uh, subclass of textualism is what is called originalism okay um, originalism is a, uh, a theory of constitutional I'm just using a short form here. Um, framers, you understand the framers of the word? Framers is the, the people who wrote the constitution. 
okay the so framers of the constitution i'll just write it again just to be clear okay so this is actually an important thing that uh, important concept that we can use even in india okay because the similar the similar uh, the systems in the, in the us and india are quite similar so originalism first of all to understand it's a subclass of textualism it's a uh, doctrine that we use only in the, mainly in constitutional uh, interpretation so originalism essentially says obviously it's a subclass of textualism so it will be similar to textualism it says that the, obviously the judges should read uh, should interpret the constitutional uh, provisions as as they are written okay and then they should also use uh, it should be done according to the original intent of the framers of the constitution so whatever the framers originally intended when they wrote it that is the way that the constitution should be interpreted that it should not be given some kind of new modern meaning etc okay so that is the that is the other doctrine that you have to be aware of you should be aware of this term this is important even in india because if you look at our uh, doctrine especially our uh, the aspects of reservation you know the reservation is a very divisive political topic in india we have all kinds of agitations and uh, things like that so it's a very important aspect in our polity now reservation again obviously in the it, there was a provision for reservation in the original constitution itself okay so now the question is when you start interpreting the uh, the various you know amendments to the reservation uh, provisions in the constitution etc so all those amendments have been made and then other uh, interpretations uh, without any additional amendments if you start applying principles like originalism you may come out with slightly uh, different kinds of judgments as opposed to you know if you don't apply the principles like originalism so this is also an important uh, concept to be aware of so originalism is a subclass of textualism it basically means the same kind of approach that you focus on what what the laws how it is written and what they originally intended when they wrote the constitution okay so we've done a lot about formalism now let's try to understand realism and then we we'll look at an example so let's first theoretically start looking at uh, just look at the theoretical definitions of legal realism and you should be able to automatically see that uh, this is very different from uh, formalism and that it is kind of diametrically opposite to formalism in some ways So if you just focus on the parts that I put in bold, that will help you to understand. Can you see how it is opposite to formalism? Because in formalism, we expressly prohibit judges from uh, bringing their social uh, views and you know views on public policy. We forbid them from bringing that into the picture while deciding a case. Okay, but in re legal realism, we are actually explicitly allowing them to do that in deciding a case. Okay. So this is the idea that uh, so this is the idea behind legal realism. So obviously now this is also a mainstream uh, judicial philosophy, and in many ways it's been quite dominant uh, in India. We tend to wax and wane between. If you look at the Supreme Court judgments, uh, it's not really very consistent. The Supreme Court because the judges keep coming and you know judges keep changing, and we don't really have an explicit debate in India in Indian society about these judicial philosophies and what is more important, what is a better philosophy. We don't have this explicit debate. But you see these philosophies being play being played out in the judgments. You can obviously see them in the judgments, as you saw in the Nirbhaya judgment. Okay, uh, clearly an example of formalism. So that's why it's important to be aware of these things. And in the U.S., there's a very active debate about these two different judicial philosophies. Okay, so legal realism essentially marked by this uh, important emphasis on the judges' social, political, and moral, uh, you know, predilections, what they believe. So different judges will judge, uh, will will uh, you know, uh, rule uh, based on their uh, views on these matters. Basically, this is more logical instead of being theoretical. Legal. This one, realism. <laughs> realism. No, no, you could actually argue that it's not very logical. It's much more subjective. Logic, we normally argue, is kind of log uh, is uh, you know is is more objective. Okay. So real uh, formalism is treated as a more objective kind of approach. Okay. Whereas uh, realism is much more subjective. Okay, so if you have different judges, let's say if you have these, you know, we have these socially cons controversial issues like abortion, 
gay marriage okay in india we recently had this uh, uh, ruling again on uh, the on uh, you know uh, intercourse between uh, same sex couples okay so these uh, 377 of the uh, of ipc okay which is uh, so unconsensual intercourse between uh, you know gay couples etc so these are all uh, hot button social issues where people have different opinions like those who are more socially conservative religious people like you know that many of the there was no difference like hindu muslim all the religious groups were opposed to uh, the uh, between uh, the, on the concept of gay sex okay between consenting couples whether hindu muslim christian all the religious groups were opposed to it because the opposition is generally on uh, religious grounds okay whereas if you saw the more liberal groups in society the uh, people like even the government i think was uh, parts of the government were in favor of uh, allowing this at least i think the congress people were talking about uh, this thing should have been allowed and all that so some parts of society were in favor so it's based also it's it's quite divisive so here again what will happen is so it's subjective because uh, if you have legal realism this ruling can go either way if i'm a very conservative judge if i'm a social conservative judge if i'm very religious then i'm probably going to uh, you know rule against uh, you know uh, intercourse between gay couples okay whether it's consensual or not okay in fact the bench of the supreme court that initially shot down the delhi high court ruling which allowed this in the case when they were when it was consensual okay the three i mean i think three judge bench of the supreme court shot it down okay saying that you should not do this because the legislature has to make the change but actually i suspect they shot it down because they were themselves conservative they were themselves religious conservatives so they didn't like it so they shot it down so you it can go either way if you believe in legal reason on the other hand if i'm a very liberal judge then i will say yes this should be allowed so it can go either way so this is the thing about now you can see slowly about the you know the merits and demerits of realism versus uh, formalism in legal realism you tend to have i mean it will create a slightly more unpredictable climate in terms of judgments because it depends on who's in charge who's sitting on the who's uh, on the bench they rely on empirical decisions more than the uh, evidence no 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 they don't rely on empirical in fact it would be almost the opposite less dependent on empirical rather than more dependent on what you believe should be the uh, the rule what you believe should be the rule let's say i'm a very liberal judge okay so then in that case i would say that okay all this stuff should be allowed gay marriage should be allowed like those who are opposed to gay marriage in the us this is a very hot button issue once again okay those who are opposed to gay marriage are opposed mainly basically they are catholics so they are because under the catholic church marriage is something between as a union between a man and a woman so obviously if you ask a catholic priest so what they want is that what the opponents proponents of gay marriage want i suspect is not just a civil union that tax for tax treatment you should treat them as a couple not like they want a catholic priest to you know conduct a marriage ceremony between a man and a man or a woman and a man a woman and a woman so that way that's where the catholic priests are objecting saying no no our religion does not allow this okay so those are actually so so legal realism is much more subjective it's based on your social preferences okay so that's why here if if the dominant judicial philosophy is legal realism it can actually create more unpredictability because it depends on who's in charge and so on these kinds of hot button social issues like gay marriage okay gay sex and gay marriage and all these abortion and all these these are all hot button issues okay so there you can actually have rulings based on depending on who's sitting on the who's in, on the bench you can the ruling can go either way all right so is this clear now yopra okay so this is what uh, this is real realism and instrumentalism is uh, instrumentalism is also basically just like realism it comes from the word comes from the idea that the law is to be used as an instrument of social change okay so if you take this 377 judgment once again let's say if i'm sitting on the supreme court and i'm the only person deciding this case and we have a law on the books which says that uh, you know any kind of intercourse between uh, same sex couples is a crime whether it is consenting adults or not okay so here i could look at this kind of a law this is what the law says let's say okay but i could look at let's say if i believe in legal realism okay and i believe in legal instrumentalism i could take the view and i'm a liberal person then i would take the view that no this is not the right way because if they are consenting adults and then we should not criminalize and because you could say that homosexuality has been there for many uh, many many years and it is there in the animal kingdom also so it is natural and you could actually say that it is determined by genetic factors okay so it is not a conscious choice that somebody is making so in any case that there should not be discrimination based on sexual orientation and this and that 
you bring in all these principles then i would say that uh, according to me this is not a fair this is a violation of article 14 etc and this is not a fair uh, rule it's not a fair law it's not a just law okay according to my liberal views of the world it is not a just law and then i would rule uh, to say that this section should not be uh, read as criminalizing uh, you know sexual intercourse between consenting adults of the same sex okay which is, is exactly what justice mullidhar of the delhi high court did when he when this case came up before him when this was first allowed that is what justice mullidhar essentially said in his judgment it's a liberal judgment and he said that this is unconstitutional because it discriminates against based people based. and so he allowed it he said essentially that 377 can remain but if it is consensual sex between adults then it should not be criminalized it should not be prosecuted as a crime that's what he said but then it went to the supreme court and the supreme court uh, bench essentially said that uh, they shot down the delhi high court judgment and said that this cannot be uh, this should not be done because any such change in the law should come from the legislature which we will see later on when we study separation of powers and branches of government the supreme court there essentially said that uh, this should not be done because if it, there's going to be a change it should come from the legislature the job of the judge is actually to uh, just apply the law mechanically so the supreme court there actually used a legal formalism type of argument they essentially said that the law is what the law says and we should not change the law the job of the judge is not to change the law or to make the law the job of the judge is to just apply the law blindly okay so uh, that's why and then eventually they won again when they went for a curative petition this is what you can do in the supreme court even if you lose a case there is a particular provision because there's no appeal at the supreme court level but there is a concept of a curative petition where you can if you feel that injustice has been done okay it has to be moved by a senior advocate etc but uh, it there you can go for a curative and that's what they did in this case they felt that that particular ruling was unjust so they went for a curative petition and that was successful okay so is this clear now what realism is okay so realism essentially you bring the uh, the uh, realism and instrumentalism you bring your uh, social preferences your views on public policy uh, you bring that into the picture when deciding a case so instrumentalism is a name that comes basically uh, from seeing the law as an instrument of social change so what the example i gave you that if, if justice mulder was doing in the delhi high court he was using the law as an instrument of social change he saw that the law legislature had not changed the law but he felt that the law as it was written was unjust so he was using the law by ruling in a particular way he was using the law as an instrument of social change and he thought that this is a desirable kind of social change that our society should evolve to the point where consensual sex is not criminalized okay so that is what is meant by that's why the name comes i mean uh, that's where the name comes from instrumentalism okay all right now let's look at an example of uh, legal realism okay which is a very famous case we have in india which is the shabano case okay many people would have heard of this case okay so in the in the other class we had uh, bharat who gave a very good uh, uh, description of he remembered quite a few things about the case he, he, he's read about that okay so i'll just briefly explain what this case is about okay so the shabano case we are going to study it as an we saw one example of legal formalism okay which is the nirbhaya case the refusal to release the the convict now we can look at an example of a legal realism okay as it played out in the shabano case okay so here what happened was this case is a very old case actually in the 85 85 judgment okay so here we had this woman shabano begum okay it is mohammad ahmed khan versus shabano begum so this woman i think she was quite old at that time maybe in her 60s or something or late 50s or something so her husband her mohammad ahmed khan he divorced her okay and then he paid the uh, dower or meher has, which has to be paid if it has not been paid earlier it has to be paid after, at the time of divorce so he paid the uh, money okay which has to be paid to her but the money was not sufficient at that time okay so she felt it was not sufficient so what she did was uh, and she had basically she she was old and she had no ways to earn a living she was not educated or all that she had no ways to earn a living so she needed some money for maintenance so in addition to the dower or mayor which she got she in additionally also sued the her husband under this particular provision which is this section 125 uh, of the code of criminal procedure which we refer to normally as crpc okay so she sued him under c 125 of the crpc you can see why she was able to do that okay or why on on the face of it, it appears that she has a right under 125 one okay so this we read as section 125 subsection 1 okay 
so he says now you see who is being made liable under this section now you have to be careful here I see a lot of problems with your senior batches using the word liable and entitled they are not able to use it in the right way okay so the example that I gave you earlier where uh, Chopra has sold a house to Rajan and they have agreed under the agreement uh, sale uh, agreement to sell they have agreed that Rajan will pay 25 lakhs and Chopra will transfer the house to Rajan's name okay so this is the agreement to sell now after he has transferred the house to Rajan's name Rajan refuses to pay the money okay so in this case the expression that we used is that Chopra is entitled to sue and we say that Rajan is liable to pay okay sometimes I've seen people saying that Raj, uh, Chopra is liable to sue okay so we, that's not how we use the word okay so we you just make sure you use the word correctly so in this case Chopra is entitled to sue and Rajan is liable to pay under the terms of the contract okay so here you can see that section 125 1 who is being made liable any person having sufficient means neglects or refuse okay any person having sufficient means is one part who has neglected or refuses or refused to maintain all these people wife illegitimate son father mother we'll see all that later okay there are many of them okay father mother all these people okay so so Shabana was suing under section 125 because it uh, gives a person a right a, a wife who is unable to maintain herself okay so it is not sufficient if she is a wife if she has a good job paying a nice salary she can't sue under this because she's not being given right because she's uh, able to maintain herself okay so she in that particular case the facts were that she didn't she was not able to maintain herself okay so now there's another problem okay you see on the face of it that now Mohammed Ahmed Khan has already divorced his wife his, he's already divorced Sabana Begum so how is she still a wife okay so you could ask this question now here what happens is if you look at the explanation to section 1 if you look at the explanation here wife can you see that okay wife includes a woman who has until she remarries even if she has been divorced or she has secured a divorce so the law is this is what is called a deeming provision you need to learn about this it's there in your notes okay this 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 is called a deeming provision okay that means technically she is not a wife obviously because she has been divorced okay but under section 125 they have already made a provision for this through this deeming provision they have given this explanation that it says wife includes a woman who has been divorced but has not remarried okay this is clear so the, for the purposes of 125 uh, this is why we call it a deeming provision because she is not actually a wife but she is deemed to be a wife okay so we can say that you know like that so all you guys are formally students of the PGDM program okay but we can say we can give some special rights to some people from the uh, BCA program we can say for this for this particular semester section A of BCA will be deemed to be also PGDM students which means they are obviously not on the face of it PGDM students but we are giving them some special privileges for this semester and deeming them to be also PGDM students so they will have the same rights as all PGDM students is this clear this is what is called a deeming provision you'll see this quite common this is quite common in the law okay so now you can see that why she has even though she has been divorced but because she hasn't remarried she can still sue under 125 one okay but now what was the problem the problem was actually that um, okay let's go I mean we don't need to look at the section there there was another problem now what happened was so when she sued in the district court she was uh, the court ruled in her favor then uh, Mohammed Ahmed Khan appealed to the high court again the high court also ruled against him and in favor of Shabano so then he eventually came to the Supreme Court so this is the Supreme Court judgment which I have given you here the highlighted part the the part that we looked at okay this is again Chief Justice Chandrachur who if you remember he was also the judge person who ruled in the Somitri Vishnu case where 497 the challenge to 497 this is happening in the same year both are happening in 1985 okay where he shot down the challenge to 497 okay so we, when this is written like this when it's written like this obviously it means here what it means is this is the full bench this is the five judge bench okay the five judges of the supreme court and this means that this guy has written the opinion okay the judgment is written by this guy okay so this is what it means okay now the problem was now what was Mohammed Ahmed Khan's defense he was saying that no this particular district court which has given this your ruling in favor of Shabano that ruling under section 125 1 should be cancelled because of the provisions of section 127 3b okay which is also from the crpc okay 127 3b 
so here what we say this is section 127 this is subsection 3 I've not extracted the whole 127 because only we are only looking at the relevant parts so this is section 127 subsection 3 and then we say sub clause B so sub clause B in subsection 3 of section 127 this is how we refer to it okay now what does it say here alteration and allowance so if there is an order made under 125 1 which gives the maintenance award to the wife okay or husband or uh, wife or a legitimate child or father mother etc now in this case it says there is an exception being created okay it says where an order has been made okay if B the, the woman has been divorced okay and she has received the whole of the sum which under any customary or personal law applicable to the parties was payable on such divorce okay if these conditions are true then the judge should cancel the order so the way you read that is that you read the first part okay if the magistrate is satisfied that x this whole thing here is x okay if the magistrate is satisfied that x in that case he shall cancel the order and then you read what x says so if x is true then the magistrate should cancel the order okay so what Muhammad Ahmed Khan is saying is that in this case you can see clearly that 127 these laws were all written by the British okay so if you go back to the British uh, Raj what was their philosophy in India their philosophy was basically to economically exploit the country obviously you have to have political control so you make sure that you are militarily in control of the whole country and you have political control of the country and then economically to exploit the country but they did not want to disturb the natives and their customs and practices so by and large the Hindus Muslims everybody they left them alone then whatever you want to do according to your personal laws you do okay so that's why you see most of the uh, changes which came in Hindu law they were actually driven by uh, reformers from within the Hindu like uh, Sati the practice of Sati which was there so you had Raja Ram Mohan Roy who was basically a Hindu reformer who agitated against Sati and then he petitioned the British so what they did is if there is a movement from within the community they would respond to it okay so they responded to it because of uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy's agitation etc and then Vidya Sagar moved on you know widow remarriage because there was days Hindus a lot of young girls used to be married off to very old people and then the husbands would die off and those poor girls would be spending their whole life as a widow which means basically you can't eat meat you can't do this that or that you know wear white saris all the time so this all this Vidya Sagar was agitating against the widow uh, he was uh, agitating in favor of uh, widow remarriage so all these acts were passed by the British so this one actually you can see section 127 3b has been clearly written the B part has been clearly written for the Muslim community because in the Muslim community there is a custom where you have to pay the you know dower or meher after and after the divorce okay you have to pay a certain amount of money especially if it has not been paid before okay so now they, what he is saying what Muhammad Ahmed Khan is saying is that according to section 127 3b clearly if you follow the black letter law there is an exception created over here right so this order should be cancelled okay and he's actually correct if you look at the technical legal point so Muhammad Ahmed Khan actually had a correct legal point because this provision had been written as an exemption for the uh, Muslim community okay because it is clearly referring to the personal law here and this custom was there only in the Muslim community so it is obviously written by the British as an exception for the Muslim community so what what Muhammad Ahmed Khan was saying is according to this you should cancel the order and technically he is correct okay so now this is where legal realism comes into play so the Supreme Court sees that there is no way to defeat this argument as such on a legal ground on a formalistic ground okay so what they say then is they go they adopt this judicial philosophy of legal realism where what they say is that if we apply the law as it stands okay then this woman will not get the maintenance award and a great injustice will be done because she will be out on her own she will not have any money for maintenance etc okay so therefore what the supreme court said is now we have to look at the purpose of this law why was this section 125 crpc why was it crafted by the british okay the purpose of this law essentially it's about maintenance okay 125 is all about maintenance so various classes of people illegitimate you can see even that illegitimate child also is being covered okay because it is meant to so the they, the judges said that the purpose of this law is to prevent vagrancy you know what vagrancy is vagrancy means you don't have a home you're just roaming around living on the streets okay so that is what vagrancy means okay so the objective of 125 crpc was to prevent vagrancy that is why the legislature introduced this law okay so then the court is saying that if we follow the black letter law 
and just go by 127.3b and uh, do not allow this woman to get some maintenance she will be out on the streets because she has no means of supporting herself okay so that will defeat the purpose of the large your law the broader law although 127 3b provision is there it will defeat the purpose of the broader law okay that which is to prevent vagrancy so therefore what we should do is we should look at we should ignore the black letter law for this but uh, you know in this particular case and ensure that justice is done and the larger purpose of the law is served okay so that 125 crpc being crafted to prevent vagrancy we do not actually have a case of vagrancy by applying 125 we do not have an absurd result yes give him the mic sir i had one doubt regarding the law uh, sir what if we reverse the rules that is uh, if shah bano is able to maintain herself and Ahmed is not able to, you know, maintain himself after the divorce. Can he also sue Shah Banar in the same law? Let's look at the law. Let's look at your because person here as such does not make a distinction between man or woman. Okay, so on the face of it, women could also be liable. But let's see who has rights. Okay, one is so in law we talk about rights and liabilities. Okay, like in that example, Rajan has a liability and Chopra has a right. Okay. So here we talk about rights and liabilities. So who is being made liable? Could be a person, could be a man or a woman. But who is being given rights? Wife. Obviously can't be a man. Legitimate or illegitimate minor child. So those are not relevant for your example. Legitimate father, mother. So D, E. Now husband is not covered anywhere. Hmm? Husband is not covered anywhere. So under 125 CRPC, the husband is not covered okay so because these are all laws which are written they were all written by the british okay so in those days in those days so yeah i think under the i have to look at the details of the but i think under the hindu marriage act now we are getting some rulings and i, I have to look at the the wordings of the act but under the hindu marriage act i think the husband can also if the husband is not earning and the wife is earning okay and the wife has more income the wife will have to pay maintenance to the husband okay i'm pretty sure that is the case okay i can check that and come back to you okay so that would be the case under that you have to, you have to go under the hindu marriage act and those who are not marrying under the hindu marriage act like the sanjay gandhi and marika gandhi they married under the special marriage act so there are some other acts okay so you can marry under so depending on which act you are married under then you'll be governed by the provisions of that act okay but 125 under 125 you can't go this is only making a man liable and giving rights to children, father, mother, wife. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, what were we discussing? So, what the Supreme Court was saying is this. That if you, uh, so if we make, uh, so the larger purpose, they have to look at the larger purpose of 125. So, they applied the black letter law. Okay. And they saw that if we apply the black letter law, <laughs> we get an absurd result, which is again, which is not absurd, which is not acceptable to us as a social outcome okay so this is where you can see clearly legal realism coming into play because the judge is not just applying the black letter law but he's also looking at the outcome outcome of applying the black letter law and he's seeing that this outcome is not socially desirable it is not something that should be happening as a matter of public policy our public policy should not lead to these kind of consequences so they therefore go back to the broader purpose of 125 to prevent vagrancy and so therefore they ignore 127 3b in, in in the light of the broader purpose of one, uh, 125 to prevent vagrancy and they still allow her to have the ma uh, the maintenance award which means they basically Muhammad Ahmed Khan's appeal as you can see here he is the one who brought it to the Supreme Court because the case is Muhammad Ahmed Khan it is not Shabano versus Muhammad Ahmed Khan it is Muhammad Ahmed Khan versus Shabano Begum which means this guy brought it to the Supreme Court he brought it to the Supreme Court that's why his name is first okay that means if he brought it to the Supreme Court means he must have lost in the lower court this is the Madhya Pradesh High Court. Okay, so that's why. So basically, they shot down his appeal. This appeal was shot down. Okay, so the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Shabano Begum. So this created actually quite a uh, sort of furor in the Muslim community because many of the men obviously felt now because what happens is once you rule in a particular way, this creates a precedent, right? This creates. You understand what is the pre? We'll study that now precedent, yes. especially. So now what will happen is even f future cases like this where many other women could come under 125 okay so there was a lot of unrest in the muslim community and again it was seen as a interference with the personal law okay by the supreme court okay so therefore what happened was in, in response to the public outcry the rajiv gandhi government came out with an act okay which is um, here so this i have not given the full form you can check it 
the full form is muslim women's protection of rights on divorce act okay this was the act that they introduced in response to the shabano judgment okay which was in favor of shabano boga begum so the rajiv gandhi government introduced this act essentially what this act said was that the uh, wife could approach many other sources in the community for aid but she could not approach the husband i mean for in cases like this where 127 3b has is applicable that means a dower or mehr has been paid to her okay in that case she can no longer approach the husband but she can approach all the other uh, people in the society okay the work of board also can be approached but not the husband okay so this was the ruling but what happened was then there was this uh, there was a guy called daniel latifi there was another famous case in response to this act okay this daniel latifi is actually arguing against the muslim women's right protection of rights and divorce act he challenged this act he said that this act is unconstitutional okay because it by basically reiterating the shabano principles and he talking about equality and this and that so daniel latifi challenged the act uh, the M mwprd act and uh, basically said that they should be shot down so what the supreme court said in that particular case is they did not shoot down the act okay but they said that despite this act being in place the woman will they actually reaffirm the shabano judgment they said that despite all this okay so there was a lot of discussion about the what the quran says and what this and that so a lot of long discussion but the bottom line was this that despite what the muslim uh, mwprd act says a woman can in shabano type of cases a woman can still come and claim maintenance under 125 so they have basically reaffirmed what they said in c of shabano begum so then after that there were many other cases on this topic basically similar topics shabana bano if you want to read this is not part of our syllabus as such okay only the shabano case is really something you have to be familiar with so all this if you want to read then you can see all the shabana bano versus imran khan all the other articles etc you can read all this stuff okay so now you understand what is meant by legal realism the objective of studying the shabano case is really to understand what is meant by legal realism okay that if you apply the black letter law you get a consequence which is not uh, socially acceptable so the judge is bringing his social and uh, political views his public policy views into the picture in deciding the case he is not just blindly following the black letter law okay that is what is meant by legal realism okay so um, you could say that you know somitri vishnu that case not a very good example but uh, when that challenge to adultery came in uh, to the 497 ipc came in uh, 1985 this case somitri vishnu uh there the supreme court actually decided not to rule they said that the legislature should change the law etc okay so you can actually see this is very funny we should look at this because here you can see chief justice chandrachur is ruling is writing the opinion this is a case of legal realism okay this is clearly he is applying the judicial philosophy of legal realism okay this is which year 1985 somitri vishnu somitri vishnu is also 1985 judge is also the same author of the opinion is also the same okay we can check the dates this is may 1985 and this is <laughs> april 1985 okay so somewhere in between he has changed the judicial philosophy okay so if you see what was happening in somitri vishnu somitri vishnu they are challenging the 497 provisions which have now been successfully challenged in 2018 okay but in 1985 the challenge failed okay the attack on 497 ipc failed in 1985 because the judge if you read the judgment essentially what he says it gives all kinds of funny stuff like you know this is how adultery always happens it is always the woman committing adultery which is actually ridiculous because in 1985 when women were not so economically independent and more likely that most of the adultery cases were being committed by men okay but he says that no no this is how it always happens etc etc so it's a very kind of funny kind of ruling and then he says essentially all these things like no then the law has to be changed by the legislature we have to interpret the law as it is written etc now what is this sounding like formalism or realism formalism. sounding like formalism okay later on we'll study separation of powers and you will see that uh, legal real uh, legal formalism is much more consistent with separation of powers okay because in separation of powers we'll see that judiciary's role is to the judiciary's role is to interpret the law not to make the law okay so that is more like formalism Okay so here you can see the same judge of the Supreme Court same year few months earlier a few months later this is one month later one month, <laughs> one month later okay so april and uh, about a month later so in one month he has changed his view 
okay now he is applying legal formalism okay and saying that uh, basically legislature has to rewrite the law etc all these kinds of things okay so you can see here that even the indian supreme court same judge with one month of uh, you know another decision he's actually applying different so they actually flip flop okay because this is partly this is happening because in india we don't have a very public debate even in law schools when we are taught lnb and things like that we don't really have a long discussion about these philosophies but in fact these judicial philosophies are hugely important because they have a massive impact on how a case is decided okay as you can see in these cases okay and you can see also in the nirbhaya case and you know other cases which we have discussed so uh, therefore this is partly happening because we don't have it in the us if you did something like this this would be a big this would be big news okay here this has not been discussed anywhere in the, even in our legal literature it's not discussed anywhere okay i'm just pointing it out to you but in the us if you did something like this this would be big news because in the us the judges are very clearly in one camp or the other so if you have a judge who is considered to be a legal formalist if he rules in a manner which is not consistent with legal formalism the whole community will be up in arms okay so because they have a much more explicit debate about these issues which i think is actually necessary in india as well since it is obviously it keeps on it it does play a role okay okay so when we discuss this now this is basically the other point that i wanted to discuss is uh this whole business of uh, formalism and here this statement okay this is there in the earlier part also when we discuss formalism and this statement that either theory can be understood in a descriptive or a prescriptive way okay if we look at the statement we just said so this may be a little bit confusing but what it means is very simple that uh, this discussion of terms like formalism and realism this can happen in a context which is kind of descriptive like when i was when i was uh, giving you the example of the nirbhaya case that particular judgment refusing to stay the release of the juvenile uh, that was an example of legal formalism okay do you think i was using the word legal formalism in a descriptive way or a prescriptive way p or d p for patna or d for delhi d for delhi right okay yeah so i was using it in a descriptive way because i was showing you an example of a particular judgment and i was saying that this particular judgment uh, is an example is an illustration of the application of this judicial philosophy called legal real uh, formalism right so i'm using the word in a descriptive way now if i start making statements like okay for a b c d reason i think that legal formalism is a much better approach than uh, legal realism okay i can always make this statement you can disagree with it or, if, or agree with it but if i'm using this state if i make this kind of statement then i'm using the word legal formalism in what kind of way in a prescriptive way because i am saying that this is better than something else okay so it's a value judgment okay so it's a normative statement that this is better because remember those are normative statements okay so that economics website that i gave you to understand positive normative for yourself please make sure there's a lot of lot of test questions in that website have you seen if you've seen that so please make sure for yourself and it is kind of fun also go through that and then click through all the examples uh, do the test for yourself and see that you have understood clearly what is positive and normative okay all right so um yeah so it can be used so that's all that the statement means there's no need to get confused about it uh, confused by it uh, this that's all that it means that formalism realism the discussion can happen in both ways or sometimes it can happen in both ways at once okay that strictly speaking is not really true this is a little confusing uh, in one instant you can only talk about it in one particular way but in the same discussion in the same discussion you might discuss it in both ways that's what they mean actually um all right okay one more point i wanted to highlight what was that i just i just thought about it and then i uh, forgot anyway i'll try to okay yeah now i know what it is actually i forget uh, i want to briefly discuss this point which is um, yes okay this whole business i think you should know about it because i don't know how many of you will take finance we may not uh, get get an opportunity to discuss with you it's a very similar distinction so what we are doing essentially is now before we move on to the discussion of science so what we have discussed is we have discussed normative versus positive okay and we have discussed a whole bunch of other distinctions which are quite similar to the normative positive distinction okay so we discussed descriptive versus prescriptive 
morality ethics on one side versus legality okay then we discussed um, positivism and formalism on one side versus realism and instrumentalism on the other side okay and then um, before I get on to the science part let me just briefly tell you um, uh, this this part now this is as far as your syllabus is concerned okay uh, now what I'm doing is I'm just to make it a little easier for you I have left out two more distinctions which are again similar to normative versus positive okay but I think you should know about it although I've left it out of your syllabus as such so there are two more distinctions one is ex ante versus ex post okay in fact I may just put this back in your syllabus since we are going to spend time discussing it okay so uh, let's just briefly discuss these two there are two more two more distinctions after formalism versus realism there is ex ante versus ex post okay there's one one of those and then there's one more which is consequentialist versus deontological okay these are two more distinctions that we have uh, let's just briefly dwell on those okay which are all similar to the normative versus positive distinction okay briefly and a this anti word have you come across this word before do you know what it means the latin word what does it mean anti if you go to a classical italian restaurant you might find that the starters are referred to as anti pasta so anti means before okay so that's what you have before the meal okay so anti is a latin word which means before so ex ante means it's a you know looking at something before it actually happens and ex post is obviously opposite okay post okay so post doctorate you do a post doctorate after your doctorate you do a post doc okay so post is after anti means before post is after so ex ante ex post means you should be familiar with these terms also that's why i wanted to put them in so ex ante means anything that you are you're looking at something before it actually happens okay ex ante analysis okay what if we decide to uh, punish the students for not having 100 percent attendance let's discuss the policy we are discussing the policy so that's an ex ante uh, perspective ex post is already we have this attendance rule okay 80 percent you're less than 80 percent your cp is zero okay so that's an ex post thing we saw that your attendance performance is such that okay it's below this so ex post is after it has happened okay ex ante is before we introduce the policy we might discuss whether it's a good policy or where should we set the threshold etc okay so the point here is that ex ante you can just briefly read about it yourself okay now ex ante essentially is about is is, is similar to the uh, idea of legal realism okay ex ante means if before you set up the policy you decide whether this whether we should have a rule like this okay whether you should have a rule like this which is uh, and what we'll do is we'll not put this as part of your syllabus but at least you should know the detailed understanding of ex ante and ex post and the other two uh, distinctions at the other distinction at the bottom uh, but briefly at least you should know which is similar to which okay so ex ante essentially is similar to the prescriptive uh, uh, idea or the normative idea okay in ex ante we say that if we have this kind of rule what will happen okay so before we make the rule we take this view that okay if we do make this so it is basically similar to normative okay it is similar to normative because we think about what is good or what is not good etc okay and ex post is similar to the uh, positive okay we just say that ex post this was the rule your attendance should have been more than 80 percent you have broken the rule so you will get zero in cp simple i'm not interested in whether this is a good policy or bad policy this is the policy i'm just following the rule okay so, so that is ex post yeah so yeah remember? use the mic yeah So, no, sir, uh, the Nuremberg trials of 1945 were the exposed, right? It was yeah, you could say that was exposed because they saw that those offenses had been committed, although in many cases they were actually making new law as they went along. But uh, so many of these laws had not been formally written down. But yeah, it is exposed because after the events have happened. Okay. Ex ante is where you now make new laws. Now we have new laws basically uh, where uh, at that time also we had the Geneva Convention and all that. But uh, some of uh, now you have new laws against genocide. Okay, you have the international, uh, the criminal court of uh, Rome, etc., and all that. So yeah, so that is exposed. Because that is, in the, some of the cases were too extreme where they have to take new laws and decisions. Yeah. But in some of them they have to just give the ruling or from giving up what. what yeah, in some of the cases where they are basically saying that yeah, so that is an exposed analysis because your the offences have already been committed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, ex post ex ante. So this is something you should be aware of. Should be aware of these terms actually. Okay. 
now one more thing here um okay yeah so let's understand one more distinction the consequentialist are big words actually but you should be comfortable with these big words consequentialist versus deontological okay so here again a consequentialist perspective essentially is uh, where you start it's an it's like an ex ante perspective okay a consequentialist perspective is like ex ante so it is more like norm normative okay you think about a policy you think about you think about a ruling if you're if you are faced with a you can again come back to the shabano case so in the shabano case if you see consequentialist means thinking about the consequences and then making your decision okay and deontological is a very big word of course but deontological essentially means it's kind of like dogmatically following the law okay just following the black letter law okay so that is obviously much more like formalism or realism formalism. yeah so deontological is much more like formalism and here you can see once again why the word consequentialist is used as we saw in the reasoning for the shabano judgment where well, they were looking at a consequentialist they were taking a consequentialist perspective they were saying that if we apply the black letter law then this woman will be out on the streets okay she will be a vagrant okay and this kind of consequence is not desirable okay for society and it is not good public policy so we should accordingly change our decision so that this our decision our our judicial pronouncement produces a good consequence okay so when you take a consequentialist perspective okay uh, you you decide your cases as a judge you decide your cases in such a way that you think that your judgment is going to produce good consequences okay that's the idea okay so consequentialist versus deontological whereas in deontological you are not really concerned about the consequences okay you just look at the law you say okay 127 3b clearly says clearly carves out an exception okay for the muslim community and therefore this woman should not get any maintenance her maintenance under 125 one should be cancelled okay consequences i am not concerned with consequences my job as a judge is to interpret the law as it is written okay so that is a deontological perspective or also essentially an ex post perspective so these are two other distinctions that should be you should be familiar with okay so let's keep that actually as as part of the syllabus so that you have some idea as to what is what and what is more similar to what so you can see you've learned uh, so many distinctions and you can are you able to see that there is some similarity between all these distinctions there is a broad similarity okay so the reason i cover them together essentially is that i believe that whenever you're covering any distinction you should cover all the related distinction because i think it helps you to retain first of all it's important for contextual knowledge also you should be aware of all these things and i think it's also helps you to retain uh, stuff better if everything is connected uh, you know may i mean i have this theory about the brain that you know i think maybe your brain is able to recall one of them and since everything is connected then in that connection everything comes back i think just it's just a theory that i think it helps you to remember things better uh, okay so these are the broad areas okay you can study them on your own okay and then uh, we come to one more element okay now we go back to this part which i wanted to cover um now where is this part on science okay that's your general link to the economics uh, material on this one i wanted to okay we already opened this actually all right okay i think this is very important to understand again once again this is a very important distinction uh, i mean uh, this idea of uh, you know the line of demarcation okay is quite important and it's quite similar to the positive normative matters okay it's quite similar and it's an important idea that you should be aware of because okay? especially if you go into some in, in, in many of the subjects you might find uh, this idea may be useful in many subjects you might find that somebody is claiming to make a scientific statement but you should have an idea of what actually is science what is a scientific statement a scientific statement has certain specific properties so every statement is not a scientific statement many economics professors like to think that their work is scientific but actually it may not be scientific because it may not may lack some of those properties okay so he has discussed this in the context of economics also but read this so this is based on this guy karl popper who is a famous philosopher of science so his idea was basically that science uh, progresses through i don't know whether he's mentioned conjecture and refutation has he mentioned it here yeah okay so he's mentioned this here so essentially if you read this part first so popper saw the growth of scientific knowledge as this 
it's a process of con conjecture and refutation okay so i as a scientist galileo says that the earth is actually the earth is moving around the sun you know at that time that was a controversial statement because the church wanted to basically hang him i mean kill him basically for that statement so he managed to save his life only because he, he went before a church uh, you know uh, i mean essentially an inquisition where they forced him to say that no the sun actually revolves around the earth because that time the view of the church was that the sun revolves around the earth but galileo's view was that the earth revolves around the sun so they forced him to say otherwise they were going to kill him so he obviously was forced to say that uh, the sun revolves uh, the earth does not revolve i mean the sun does not revolve around the sun, the earth the earth revolves i mean sorry i'm getting confused so he was forced to say that the uh, sun revolves around the earth okay and the earth does not revolve around the sun but what he said actually was this is like that ashwatthama incident where uh, even though in the f uh, for the you know the hearing of the court he said that uh, the earth does not revolve around the sun but under his breath he again said but it does okay just to save you know his own conscience so that is what happened to galileo okay in those days so the point is essentially that is a conjecture so what galileo put forward was a conjecture he you understand what a conjecture is yeah, that i think this building is uh, uh, yeah it's a conjecture is a statement of what is true what is likely to be true but without any proof okay yeah you're just making a guess okay so i i make a conjecture this building is 500 feet tall now you may actually measure it and find that it is not uh, 500 feet tall okay so it may be 600 or 300 or whatever it is so that's a conjecture okay so now obviously what would happen how would conjecture and refutation work if i make a conjecture this building is 500 feet tall a block then you just take a some some form of measuring and you measure it and then you find that it's actually 300 feet tall so you have refuted my conjecture is this clear you measure it and you find that my conjecture is not correct so you have refuted my conjecture that is what conjecture and refutation means so what popper is saying is it's very important to have this understanding of the philosophy of science as as uh, explained by popper and then uh, his idea of what is a scientific statement so he's saying so this is how science progresses people will make conjectures like the earth revolves around the sun and then then people can go and test and see whether this conjecture is correct or not okay so this is how basically science progresses so what he's saying is that that when here when you have a yeah so this is an important point that statement is scientific when it is okay so when i make the statement is it so that the word that we use is falsifiable so when i make this statement that this a block is 500 feet tall tall is this a falsifiable statement yes. Yes. gulati is saying no yes. achha, achha, i thought you were shaking your head like this okay all right so is this a falsifiable statement yes sir it is a falsifiable statement because you can just go measure the height of the building and see whether it is uh, true or not okay so again falsifiable statement just like we said that the positive statement need not be true okay it just has to be something that can be objectively checked okay or tested similarly again a scientific statement doesn't have to be true it has to be only a sufficiently specific statement so that it can be objectively tested and verified to be true or basically tested to be i was shown to be false okay so falsifiable doesn't mean that it has to be shown as always false falsifiable means can be tested for either its truth or its falsehood can be ob objectively tested okay so if i say that you know uh, living together is is bad is immoral is that a is that a falsifiable statement if I, if I say that couples living together before marriage is immoral is that a falsifiable statement some are saying yes some are not convinced it's a falsifiable statement how would you falsify it if i say that it's immoral hmm? i'm saying that couples living together before marriage is immoral okay how will you is it a falsifiable statement you can't falsify it's a it's a moral statement i can say that drinking alcohol is immoral if i say that drinking alcohol is immoral that is not falsifiable if i say that cigarette smoking leads to cancer that is falsifiable because you can check okay there are difficulties of inference and all that but it is on the face of it it's a falsifiable statement 
that cigarette smoking leads to cancer this is a falsifiable statement okay but if i say that consumption of alcohol is immoral this is not a falsifiable statement so statements which are falsifiable are likely to be more like positive or normative statements which are falsifiable are more likely to be positive okay now you can see the statement when i said that consumption of alcohol is immoral is this a positive statement or normative statement it's a normative statement okay because i'm making this kind of i'm saying better or worse etc okay so therefore so this is the idea this is why i'm discussing this point also and also it's very important for everyone to be aware of karl popper's idea of a science which is very widely accepted what is actually meant by a science and what is meant by a scientific statement okay so therefore he must have said he must have used the word falsifiability also as he actually used the word falsifiability he's not used it but this is the same idea capable of being false so a falsifiable statement is a statement which is capable of being shown to be false okay or true okay so whatever that that's the word that we use falsifiable so therefore a scientific statement is one that has to be falsifiable okay that i will say that the sun is not going to rise in the east tomorrow that is a falsifiable statement because you can just wait till tomorrow morning and see if it rises or not okay so those are so you have to be able to identify for yourself what are falsifiable statements okay so according to the popperian definition of science these are actually which is a good definition these are the only su subjects uh, these are only statements which are scientific those which are falsifiable so if you make all kinds of mumbo jumbo statements which are you know you'll see non kinds of when you listen to business tv i have asked you to listen to business tv you'll talk you'll see a lot of analysts talking about the market okay they will say oh yeah yeah the stock market is quite bullish i think the market should be quite strong do you think these are falsifiable statements because what is what is the meaning of strong okay strong is like a it does it's not sufficiently specific okay so you have to identify you need to develop this sense that when somebody is making a statement in the world of business you will find this all the time that people are making statements which are not falsifiable and at the same time they claim to be experts or they claim to be claiming to be giving useful advice but generally it is true that only the statements which are falsifiable only they provide useful advice okay because you can actually do something specific with by looking at a particular boundary etc okay people are getting very restless but i don't think that time is up yet okay time is why is the alarm not ringing no i think the alarm is ringing whether well, some funny sound coming which i anyway so anyway you guys are free now you can go <laughs> i have consumed 25 second of your of your lunch okay